Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with fabulous concert programs, number 90 or something like that. Oh, my God, there are so many of these things. We are continuing our Tournemere Symphony Cycle with his largest and grandest and biggest, well, second biggest, well, depends on how you look at forces, his biggest purely orchestral symphony, certainly his longest, and in many ways, his craziest. It's called The Dances of Life. Symphony number no. seven from 1918, which is when he composed it. This piece is nuts and so much fun, but it's a big, long sucker. It's in five movements, each of which is 15 minutes long. Add it up, 75 minutes. We're talking about like as long as, well, you know, the Mrs. Solemnis sort of kind of, or, 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 you know, a big juicy Mahler symphony, like, you know, number, number two somewhere is in there. Usually maybe it's a little longer than Mahler, but it's really extraordinary. It's an extravaganza scored for an enormous orchestra, ending with the peal of bells and cymbals and crashing and bashing. Actually, Actually, a lot of Tournament Symphonies end with peals of bells. He was really into bells. It was a thing with him. They had a certain spiritual connection to his, his um, intense Catholic upbringing and concern with religiousness and mysticism and all of those goodies because he was primarily an organist. He's one of those French organist guys. And so, yeah. Bells were really the thing. Anyway, there is only one good recording of Symphony Number no. 7. It's this one with the, uh, let's see, Orchestre Philharmonique de Liège et de la Communauté Française under Pierre Bartholomé. There it is. Now, this is available for streaming. You probably won't find physical product. The only other recording is the Antonio d'Almeida Marco Polo recording, and frankly, it's, it's just too tentative. With the Moscow Symphony, it, it, it really is the tempo year, very slow, and it all sounds kind of hesitant. And in an hour and 15 minute long piece, you just don't want that. You want something a little zippier and a little more confident, better played, better recorded, and this is the one. It happens to be coupled this with the third symphony that we've been talking about recently, and we all think is so gorgeous, the Moscow, which is fabulous. So yeah, this is a great album to get. Um, and if you can only get it by streaming, then get it that way, because this is the way you're going to hear it at home, because you're never going to hear it live. Who are we kidding, right? Anyway, the, but we got to talk about these movements. This is so much fun. The movements are labeled, you ready? Um, Dance of Primitive Times. And this is one of those grunty, belchy, low note things that's so much fun. I mean, it really is amazing because, you know, you know, Tournemere was horrified by Stravinsky in the Rite of Spring. And then, of course, then he goes and writes something that's kind of similar. I mean, it's not the Rite of Spring, but it's, you know, conceptually, it's his version of what was going on there. It's really fun. And then there's the, the dance of gentility, elegance, civilization, you might call it. And the dance of, of uh, dance, oh, medieval dances. The medieval dances are kind of fun. They're kind of folky and 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 modal, and, and you know it's what you kind of expect from medieval dancing, right? Do we expect anything from medieval dancing? Well, here's your chance. And then we've got dance sanglant, bloody dances, war, battle, viciousness, misery, violence. Ah, oh, what could be more fun? And then finally. Dance of Future Times, or dances, it's all plural, by the way. Dances of Future Times. So you get Tournemere's vision of the future. I mean, this is really kind of a radical piece. It's it, You might want to think about it, um, if you know the work, as a prototypical version of Messiaen, of like the Tarangalela Symphony or something like that. It's just one of these wonderful, you know, kind of totally original extravaganzas. Now, this is not an easy piece, I think, to bring an audience to. And I had a real problem programming it because it's long. I mean, an hour and 15 minutes in this performance could easily be five minutes longer. You know, couldn't really be shorter, I don't think. So what do you do? No one's going to come and see Tournemere's Seventh Symphony. Of course, you'll all run out and listen to it. 
because it's part of this series. But I'm pretending that there's actually a possibility that something like this will be performed. No one is going to come see this unknown composer doing this big, long symphony. That's the only thing on the program. So I tried to make the program a little bit more conceptually interesting, even though it's longer, by putting something on a first half. And it's not a long first half. The first half is Copland's Dance Symphony. Well, there you go, right? You've got two dance symphonies, although the Copland really is based on the dance. The Copland is based on three dances from his early ballet, Grog, which is a vampire story. Yeah, really cool. It's a wonderful early jazzy work of Copland. It is completely aesthetically opposed to everything that Tornemir stood for. Tornemir would have been appalled by the Copland, which is what makes it so much fun because musically they're completely contrasted. And that's why I think it works because you're not going to be fatigued by having, you know, too much of the same um, on the program. And it's only 20 minutes long in three movements and lots of fun. So it makes a nice, refreshing sort of peppy opening. And then you come back and you can like, you know, sink your fangs into into Tornemir, um, if that's if that's what you want. I think that kind of works. I really do. Um, and it just as a as a matter of contrast, it's fascinating because the Copeland was written while he was still very much under the influence of Nadia Boulanger and the French. It was from his French period. He wrote it in 1929 or just after his French period. Um, in 1929, the Tournemir was 1918. One is heavily influenced by jazz and is a real dance piece. The other is dances in a cosmic sort of play of the universe sense. Um, a completely different idea of the dance. Really kind of a wonderful program, I think, when you think about it conceptually. Um, you know, how you want to sit through it, well, that's up to you, because you'll be playing it at home and you can do it any way you like. And that's how I recommend that you do it, um, any way you like. But do do it, because the Copeland is a rarity, but the name may attract some people in a way the Tournemere's does not. And the Tournemere is just astonishingly fabulous and amazing. So give it a shot. You, you know, you'll just enjoy yourself. It's a fun evening. It really is. You get to kill, kill about an hour and 40 minutes of just glorious, extravagant music. Marvelous, rhythmic, pulsating, lively, brilliant, coruscating music. And what could be better than that? So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.